This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. 7.48 in the morning. This is the morning run with Shazana Chuang and Noel. Alas, for Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, the solid, formidable and convincing support from MPs that he claimed to have back in September failed to materialise for him last week. The Port Dixon MP had garnered the support of 105 MPs, while our new Prime Minister, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri, cobbled together 114 MPs. And of course, yeah, Anwar called upon PH leaders and supporters to accept the King's decision uh, to appoint Ismail Sabri as the ninth Prime Minister. He said the outcome showed the opposition must work harder to face G15, which could be held next year or in 2023. So Anwar also called for collective action to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. We're asking what does this mean for the future of Anwar and Pakatan Harapan moving forward? For more on this, we have political commentator Dr. James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania joining us. Good morning, James. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Always great to have you. What happened to Pakatan Harapan? I mean, we had several of our commentators say that this was their race to lose. So what went wrong for them and particularly Anwar Ibrahim? Uh, good morning. So I think the stories are still coming out. I think it's too early to make an assessments. Uh, but what we can say is that uh, Pakatan Harapan made several strategic mistakes. But I think it's too early for me to comment on the details simply because a lot of the stories are coming out. So for example, um, the stories about what happened in East Malaysia with GPS, uh, that is slowly coming out. And also we're getting uh, more and more uh, reports on this side on what has happened to Pakatan, especially during the crucial meeting on a Friday night when they met uh, in relation to the uh, offer by Mu Yeding to deal with the deep-seated reforms that Malaysia needed. Anyway, so uh, knowing that this is Malaysia, uh, all the stories will come out shortly, but I think it's a bit too early for me to comment other than that, that the blaming game has begun. Well, it seems like people do blame PH and in particular Anwar for the return of AMNO. Should Anwar consider making clear a succession plan now for PKR to make way for new faces? Well, I think Anwar should have made clear the succession plan many years ago. Uh, but the reality is that Anwar has uh, two two things going for him. One is the fact that uh, ever since Asmin Ali has left the party, uh, it's very difficult for people to identify individual who can step up for the job. So there's really nobody in in uh, in uh, PKR now who can sort of step in the role if he were to say uh, step down in the next 12 months. Uh, the second big thing for Anwar, of course, is that he's the glue that holds uh, Pakatan together. He's holding uh, DAP on one side, Amana on the other side. So without him, I think it's very, very difficult for Pakatan Harapan to survive. Uh, so given the fact that he's got these two special things going for him, I don't expect him to step down anytime soon. Well, well, given the fact that East Malaysia did not support Pakatan, do you think that um, he should try and, well, at least the part, the coalition should make concessions within East Malaysia to perhaps, you know, contest less seats over there and to gain more fans uh, on East Malaysia? I think uh, part of the problem with East Malaysia is that uh, there is a deep divide between the political elites in Sabah and Sarawak. So on paper, they really should be united uh, when they negotiate with Putrajaya. But in reality, and for historical reasons, they're highly divided. So part of the reasons why uh, Shafi was not acceptable to the leadership in Sarawak uh, is, is due to uh, historical divisions between Kota Kinabalu and Kuching. So until that is resolved, I think it's uh, very difficult to resolve uh, issues relating to Sabah and Sarawak. I'll just add one more thing. Huh? I think it's also very difficult for Putrajaya to resolve uh, Sabah and Sarawak issues if the federal government on this side uh, can't get it act together. So we saw this very clearly during the uh, Muyading administration because uh, uh, they spent all the time in fighting and trying to deal with, uh, I'm not trying to pull them down. Uh, Sabah and Sarawak issues were really on the back burner. So a lot depends on on, on uh, the federal government. If the federal government is intact, they're strong, uh, working efficiently, then they can deal with Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, until that day comes, I'm afraid Sabah and Sarawak will have to be on the back burner. Well, James, there's a school of thought which suggests that uh, Sabah and Sarawak don't really care who's, in, who's the Prime Minister as long as they can get what they want. And in the interim period between now and G15, and even G15, how can East Malaysia basically step up and make their wishes known? And in fact, what are the three priority areas for East Malaysia? Right. Uh, in terms of the school of thought, I think you're talking about me. I'm the one telling people that they don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, yes, 
In terms of priority, I, I think basically uh, the sort of things that Sama and Surat wants is basically what they've been asking for a very long time. Uh, top of the list is that they want some sort of uh, formal recognition for Malaysia Agreement 63. Uh, secondly, uh, when I talk about formal recognition, I mean uh, it has to be inside the constitution. Uh, most people do not realize that if you read through the current the, the current version of the Malaysian constitution, Malaysia Agreement is actually not mentioned. Uh, when I tell my friends that, they're quite shocked. Uh, secondly, I think they want uh, much more autonomy, as in autonomy in all the key areas, health, education, uh, that sort of thing. And of course, third thing, they want a lot more money. Uh, they feel that for the last 50 years, a lot of the resources for Sabah and Sarawak, the dividends from the resource actually ended up on the North-South Highway, the Petronas Tower, KLIA1, KLIA2. So basically, they want uh, more money on the other side to, to build those two states. So I think these three are the priority areas. So do you expect Sabri will give in to all the demands of uh, by Sarawak and Sabah? Uh, no, no. Uh, my take is that uh, between now and next year, uh, his, his biggest headache is, of course, the Basatu. And secondly, of course, the COVID issue. Uh, he has to be very careful how he deals the COVID. And of course, COVID is linked to things like reopening the economy. Uh, because if he doesn't get COVID right, uh, then uh, his government will be really under the hammer of the next GE. So uh, COVID will basically be his number one priority. Secondly, is, is I suspect he will have to do something of Bersatu. Uh, these two will, will take up 90% of his time. Um, and the other 10%, uh, James, maybe I can ask a little bit about Datuk Sri Shafi Abdal when it comes to Pakatan Harapan. I mean, he's claiming that he could have changed the course of last week's events if he was um, Pakatan Harapan's candidate for prime minister. Do you think Datuk Sri Shafi Abdal will have a larger role um, now that uh, Sabri, Ismail Sabri is in the prime minister seat? I'm not sure he will have a larger role, but he has a much larger public profile now. So now I think among uh, uh, Malayans or West Malaysians, I think uh, there's a recognition that there is a political leader from uh, East Malaysia, Sabah or Sarawak, who's willing to take on national leadership. I think if you were to ask the same question, say, say uh, three or even four years ago, right, uh, nobody will sort of look at any leader from East Malaysia in a serious way. Now at least the political class say that, yes, there is somebody stepping up who's willing to show his hand and say that I'm willing to lead Malaysia. So I think that is a really, really positive political development for the country. Uh, but I don't think he will have a major role to play in, in, in the uh, uh, Sabri administration. Yeah, James, uh, a number of um, MPs that support Ismail Sabri within his 114 uh, MPs uh, comprise members of the court cluster. What What is your sense of what uh, Ismail Sabri will do with the court cluster? Um, everything I've been saying this, everything will be dependent on the confidence vote. Uh, people keep harping on the 114 number. The 114 number is actually irrelevant. The only vote that, that matters is the vote uh, in the upcoming September sitting. Uh, and that one is not 114. It could be anything. Because even though the new government has been formed, uh, the lobbying has not stopped. So we have to see what the majority is. Uh, if he gets a big majority, when I say big majority, what I mean is a stable government. And here I'm talking about anything uh, north of 125, uh, then he'll be in a much stronger position. If he gets something like 120, 114 to 120, uh, then he'll still be very, very vulnerable like the uh, Muyeding administration. Because essentially you're talking about if five or six people unhappy with you. Uh, jump out, then you're in big trouble. So everything will be dependent on, on what sort of... Uh, uh, figures that he'll be getting during the September vote. Do you expect he will survive it? Oh, he will survive. I'm talking about the margin of victory. Obviously, if he has a, a big margin, like I said, 125 uh, or, or north of 125, right, then he will have much more leeway dealing with the court cluster and all his dissidents inside his own party. And of course, James, within the more important set, um, terms of the cabinet appointments, um, especially international trade, finance, education, and of course, health, um, the business community want to have some kind of certainty. What is your sense of the names that he's going to appoint to the cabinet? I think all the all the uh, key positions will basically be reserved for for AMNO, and maybe one or two of the key positions will be given to Besatu and GPS. So I think the the people he'll pick will be fairly similar to what we had in the Muyering administration. It will mainly be a reshuffle. Some people will be given uh, a new roles to play. 
he my take is that he'll probably bring in uh, some of the people who are sidelined during the Muhyiddin administration uh, because of the uh, uh, what do you call it the fight inside the Muhyiddin he'll bring some of those people back and he'll probably uh, keep one or two places empty because he's got to bring more MPs over from the other side uh, so basically uh, very very little change uh, in terms of economic policy I suspect uh, little change in personnel but there will be some change in policies because I think there's a clear agreement in the business community that uh, the, the previous finance minister was not doing a good job. James, thanks so much for speaking with us. I know we'll have more conversations with you on this in the future. That was political commentator Dr. James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania, talking to us about the landscape for Pakatan Harapan and also putting some guesses forward on what um, the new Prime Minister's cabinet is going to look like. I just don't know what the KLCI is going to do at 9.01 in the morning. Do you think it's going to go up right now? Yes, I think so. I mean, because it's political stability now, right, until September. BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.